Welcome to the very first episode of the Pop Dust Podcast. I'm Jordan Edwards, producer at Pop Dust. I mostly work on the Pop Dust Eats side and the food side of things, which has obviously been halted by COVID-19. So for my first show, I wanted to have someone from the New York restaurant scene to talk about the situation. And I couldn't think of anyone better to have on than my first guest, Brooklyn Chop House Director of Operations, Stratus Morfogan. Stratus, how are you? Good. We're home. You know what? It can't be that bad, but we'd like to be in the restaurant right now selling some food. Right, right. Now, you guys have remained open for carry out and delivery, but you're also doing something extra. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing for healthcare workers and people who really need to be out there right now? Yeah. So, you know what? You know, when this all happened, prior to this happening, we had a big business, a thriving business. And, um, you know, January was 80% uh, year over year. I mean, we were just celebrating life. Everything was great. And then it wasn't. <laughs> this whole thing just basically collapsed. And you know what? When we had to shut down, and we've always had delivery and takeout business, but that's not really what we really signed up for. But uh, with the delivery and takeout business, I appreciate it. It's been great. We put a bunch of people back to work. But... Uh, when we sat around and we said, what do we do now? We don't know how long this thing's going to be. Coincidentally, I was in the emergency room like, like a week before the close, the, before everything was closed down. And I just saw the nurses and, you know, the, 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 the whole emergency room staff. This was like the first days of, uh, of coronavirus at New York Presbyterian. And I saw these heroes, the way they were working. And I was in there for something else. I had something stuck in my throat, basically. But when I saw them and when this all happened, I said, you know what, guys? I spoke to my partners, uh, Robert Cummings and Dave Thomas. We said, what do you want to do here? And, they, and we all agreed at that point is, you know what? Let's give back. Let's take care of our heroes. Let's take care of the frontliners. You know, let's do dinners for them. So we started doing dinners at New York Presbyterian because they're literally a block from the restaurant. And we were doing packages for like 20 you know, from three or four chicken dishes, vegetables, some steaks. Uh, and then we added Forever Young Wine. We added uh, After Five Coffee. We added Junior's Cheesecakes. We added Boss Water. And uh, little by little, it grew from like two emergency rooms. Uh, and then it really exploded on Instagram where all the medical uh, heroes were posting Instagram and, and, and different pictures of them thanking us for it. And then all of a sudden, we got hit by like 100 different hospitals saying, can we help? I reached out to my vendors and I said, could you guys up it? Because I can't afford to do 15 hospitals at almost 2,500 meals a week. So thankfully, other unsung heroes are my vendors. Jay King's and all the companies I just mentioned, they donated thousands and thousands of pounds of chicken, steaks, packaging materials, vegetables, produce, uh, boss water, coffee, all the things I mentioned. And uh, now we're up to about 14 different emergency rooms and ICU units all throughout the metro area. And that really feels good. The morale booster that must be after a long day of taking care of people to have a gourmet meal as opposed to a fast food sandwich just must be just a really nice thing to have. Uh, Bellevue Hospital, the ICU unit, about it was like 20 medical staffers in a conference room. They had all our food displayed all over the conference room with a beautiful photograph. And each one held a letter for thank you. And it was about 12 feet long. And you know what? That's that, that's amazing. That makes us feel so good. Where we're at a time right now where we can sit back, self pity. You know why did why did this have to happen? Why did this have to happen? Or we could do something good or something about it where we could put our mark even though how significant or insignificant it is, it's our little mark that we could say 10, 20 years from now that, you know what, we were there, we were there, you know, we were there for the, uh, for the frontliners. Yeah. We made sure that they, they had, had at least they got a smile for like 20 minutes a day. What are you doing to protect your staff and the delivery people who are, who are helping with this situation? We, We just designed a whole new face and chef gear. We posted it on our Instagram, and basically what it is is it's a hat. It looks like a fishing hat, and it has a, it has a, a clear shield that goes all around, and it goes down to the breastbone. 
Uh, this, I believe, is going to be the new norm. I can say Brooklyn Chop House is the first to use it. And everybody now has to wear those instead of your traditional, uh, you know, chef hat. And mm-hmm. it's, it's not enough. Today, it's not enough. Knowing that what, what happens with the transfer of saliva, we need to protect everything from the dishwashers to the food runners to the people that are receiving deliveries, for the people that are prepping the food, down to the line cooks, to the chefs, and the dim sum. Everybody has to wear a shielded mask. And that's how we're gonna do it from now on. I designed it with a company uh, that basically we did like FDA material around the hat, you know, cause they have these things on Amazon that you could buy, but this thing is now made for like, you know, the hospitality industry. Now your family has been in the New York restaurant business since the 1890s. Can you give us a little background about your family's history in New York and how you kind of came to be where you're at? So my uh, grandfather, his brothers, they arrived here in the mid 1800s. In 1894, Mm -hmm. they went to open their first restaurant, but with the name Morphogenis, they couldn't get a lease on 14th Street in Manhattan. So what they did was they cut the IS off the name and they reapplied under Morphogen. And there the lease was ready for them to sign. And there they started a restaurant called Pappas Restaurant. And that was there for about 80 years, uh, right on 14th Street between 8th and 9th Avenue. And then from there, my father opened all the Chelsea House restaurants. Uh, they, they started in 1956 to 1985. And, and basically, uh, actually, Brooklyn Chop House is, uh, is an ode to my father. That's actually the font of Chelsea Chop House. Uh, I knew I was going to do a chop house, and I knew I was going to copy the whole concept that my father came up with uh, in the 50s, but I wanted to come more with like my own version of it, uh, bringing in dumplings. I, I grew up in a typical Greek family. Uh, my dad had about 14 restaurants and diners. If you ever seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding, well, that was really much my biography, <laughs> to put it, put it in short. My, my dad literally had a, a Windex bottle in a holster around his waist, walking around the diner. Everything was Windex, and it's no joke, because my dad, with a very strong Greek accent, and my name being Stratus, was, Sonny, get the Windex. I've heard that comment since I was five years old. You've had multiple restaurants over the years, um, and the restaurant business, even in good times, is not an easy business to be in, so you must be built for it. You know, I, I, li- I live, eat, breathe, sleep it since birth. People would say, hey, I'm thinking about investing in the restaurant industry. And I would tell them, listen, put your money in mutual funds, because if you don't breathe, eat and sleep it, you're you're, the probability is it's going to fail. Because there's very few operators out there, even the best operators, you know, bat four or five hundred. You know, no way are they they bat a thousand unless you're going to invest in someone that you believe in, including myself. I've had about 17 restaurants and nightclubs in my life. I've had four failures and I'm not afraid to say it. The, one of the failures, I was 25 years old and thought I knew the world. And that was just, you know, I didn't change with the times. And it failed. Another time was a $400 million hotel went bankrupt in, uh, you know, during the crash of 08 uh, in Miami. And my business, which was thriving at the time, investors lost their money. They got 40% of their money the first year. But year two was 08. And the Gansevoort Hotel went bankrupt and went foreclosed. How am I going to operate a restaurant inside a boarded up hotel? But it's a failure. Investors didn't get their money back. So what I'm trying to say is that I've had people that have continuously partnered with me and given me a blank check. And they know that we're not batting a thousand, but they're doing pretty well with me because in the long run, if you stay with that entrepreneur and believe in him or her, you'll you'll make a good investment. But if you're going to do a one off, I strongly suggest not to do it. You are now venturing into the retail side of things. You're going to be offering your dumplings in Walmart and you're partnering with Patty LaBelle. So tell me about uh, the retail side of things, why you want to put your dumplings in stores and how the partnership with Patty LaBelle came about. Pastrami, the Reuben, the Philly cheesesteak, the lamb gyro, the bacon cheeseburger, uh, even down to peanut butter and jelly can all be delivered in a dumpling form. And what happened is like the first weeks that we opened, it became like gang, I mean, gangbuster business and boom, because people were on social media was going crazy with my dumplings. Uh, two things happened the first few weeks. One is the uh, publishers of Macmillan and Page Street Publishing 
we're at a we're at a big table of about eight, and they tried uh, all the different dumplings, and they said they'd like to do a book with the guy or girl whoever wrote this menu. I was introduced to them, and they wanted me to basically write a book, and my book will be coming out uh, at the end of 2020 called Damn Good Dumplings, uh, 45 traditional sandwiches converted to dumplings. I'd say a week after that, Patty LaBelle's having dinner, who's been a friend and a, and a supporter of my restaurants for about 15 years. Patty's having dinner with her son, Zuri. And we, I was congratulating them on the success of Walmart. And I said, Patty, I want to do a little menu for you. I want to do a bunch of dumplings. And she said, well, uh, I don't like dumplings. And I said, well, I want you to try my dumplings. And uh, so she tried the French onion soup the lamb gyro, the bacon cheeseburger, the Philly cheesesteak. And within about 15 minutes, she says, we got to go to Arkansas. And I said, can we just go to Hawaii or somewhere? Maybe like, uh, you know, somewhere by the beach? Why Arkansas? She's like, I want to introduce this to the buyers at Walmart. I said, really? I said, that sounds really exciting. So fast forward two weeks later, we were in Bentonville, Arkansas at the head of Walmart. And I did a presentation for all the head buyers. And within about 30 minutes, uh, they said that was the greatest thing they've ever experienced. And they put a huge purchase order in. And all our dumplings will be on the shelves of Walmart at the end, sometime in the fourth quarter. Now, with the situation that's happening right now, is that affecting your your workflow? Is that going to affect this order? H- how is your how is your co-packing situation? What's going on there? Well, it doesn't affect us that much because we, we were not scheduled to uh, start the packet, the uh the manufacturing of the dumplings at our co-packer, we were not scheduled to do it until September. So I'm I, I, not that I'm an optimist, but I am a realist. I mean, there's no way this economy is going to be shut down that long. So I, I, I think we'll be on schedule. It might be a month or two delayed, but they, but everything is moving forward. And we're going to be launching Brooklyn dumpling shops uh, sometime this summer. Uh, those are 500 square feet little stores. The first one is on First Avenue in St. Mark's Place in Manhattan. And the whole concept is 32 types of dumplings, 24 hours a day. What will people actually be able to buy in Walmart in the fall? Uh, The pastrami dumpling, the bacon cheeseburger, the lamb gyro, the Philly cheesesteak dumplings. And then we're doing four chicken dishes, which is the Beijing chicken, the velvet chicken, spicy, kung pao, and sweet and sour. And then we're doing the uh, green shrimp, the spinach prawns. And, you know, they want to make it, and I give them a lot of credit, they want to make this a little bit upscale and more boutique-ish to their their shoppers. And I give them a lot of credit. I I want to just talk a little bit about the the situation within the industry, the restaurant industry here in New York. You have restaurants who are completely closed, restaurants who are open just for takeout and delivery, and you have all these uh, crowdfunding Kickstarter situations going on to help put some money in the pockets of the restaurant staffs. What needs to happen in New York and across the country for the damage to be minimized in terms of restaurants closing permanently? Well, listen, one thing I don't, I never discuss is politics. And the truth is I don't vote because I don't believe in politicians. Uh, The last time I voted was Ross Perot and that was 1992. I, I, I just don't believe in your status quo politicians. Uh, and I've pretty much been proven right because they're all full of shit. To tell you the truth, I hope I can curse on your show, but they're they're all they're all full of shit. And uh, so what I will say, the plan that Nuchkin, Manuchkin, and uh, Trump have laid out will stop us from going into a depression. Um, if if what he's saying is true, that the banks will. Uh, will basically subsidize the restaurants to make sure that everybody stays on the payroll. I'm, I'm all for it. I had 65 employees. Right now I have about 12. A lot of the 65, in all fairness, like 35 were part-timers, hourly wage, like tipped employees, which were part of our family. But we had about 25 that were like salaried, and we're down to half of that. That's all we can afford, um, especially that we are putting out, we put out a lot of donations as well. There's just so much we can do. If they come up with the stimulus package to help small businesses, and I believe that how you treat small business is a difference between going into a depression, a recession, or keeping everything status quo. 
I don't believe anything's going to be status quo until there's a uh, till there's a vaccine uh, for this horrible disease. But I do believe that we can get everything back to maintenance, uh, providing that you know we, we've applied for our assistance. Well, we're hopefully it's going to come through because once it comes through, I'll hire my 45 staffers right away and put them on the payroll. But until then, I can't afford thirty thousand dollars a week. You sound pretty optimistic, though. I do. I do. I, I think that uh, I think things will start opening uh, b- before Memorial Day weekend. Um, I think it's not going to be. I don't think it's. I don't think it's, we're going to get to a norm until there is a vaccine. I don't think people are going to go into you know crowded nightclubs, casinos, and restaurants until there is some kind of therapeutic, uh, some some kind of something where people feel comfortable. Maybe it's their antibody. Whatever it is, you know, I, I do. I'm up. To, I'm up on everything. And, um, until then, I do believe that the economy has to open up, and I do believe that the stimulus money has to get to the right small business owners, because if not, this will be a deep depression. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. The the unknown through all this is how, regardless of of whether or not New York opens up by by Memorial Day, is how this will affect the summer tourist season if people will still come in droves to visit Times Square and go to Broadway shows. I, I do believe that you're going to probably see 75% of the people with masks on. I don't think you're going to, I think a lot of our, you know what, if you want to see silver lining, this is my silver lining. Two things that come to mind. One is, is that we're going to change our ways. 54,000 people for the last eight years, each year die of flu related illnesses. I believe we stop shaking hands. I believe that we, 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 we you know, up our game in hygiene, wash our hands more often. I believe you're going to see that $54,000, 54,000, sorry, 54,000 person death rate for influenza. I believe, and I'm not a doctor, but I do believe you're going to see that number drop significantly in the next eight years, where we've had over 500,000 people dead in the last eight. I believe that number is going to drop significantly because we're gonna change our ways. We've been forced to change our ways. And you know what? I think that this, at, at the end of the day, we look back at this five, six years from now, I believe a lot of lives will be saved because of what happened. This was a horrible wake up call. And, and on a much smaller level, but I'm an animal lover. I love that all the shelters are empty. People are adopting dogs yeah. and cats. I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing. You know what? I, I, I'm a dog lover and a pet lover. And when I heard that, I was like, you know what? We've got to take some of the good and and like, you know, channel that into our our energy and just do better. You know what? We've always, in all my restaurants, I've always practiced. I've had antibacterial pumps in every area of my preparation area inside my kitchen. And some of the restaurateurs would walk in my kitchen and laugh and say, what is this, an emergency room? Why are there so many pumps all over the walls? Yeah. And I'm like, because I do believe that, that, you know what? We're dealing with chicken. We're dealing with pork. We're dealing with vegetables. We're dealing with a lot of cross, possible cross contaminants. And you know what? Everybody, even before they put their gloves on, has to do two pumps of antibacterial and keep it for about at least 60 seconds, just rubbing their hands before they put their gloves on. And then they have to change the gloves every hour. Restaurants didn't do things like that. I'll let you go here, Stratus. I really appreciate you talking to me. And I wish you the best for Brooklyn Chop House and the rest of the New York restaurants that are struggling out there that are trying to do their best. And I hope that we can come out of this soon and with minimal damage to the economy. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jordan. It's always great to be on with you. All right. Stay safe. All right. You too. Take it easy. Thanks for listening to the Pop Dust Podcast. I'm Jordan Edwards. You can find me at jordanedwardsstudio.com and at jordanedwardsstudio on Instagram. And be sure to check out the latest in pop culture and entertainment at popdust.com.